The General Assembly of the United Nations continued debating the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan today. 1,800 T-62 tanks. My friends, I want to ask for your help to make sure that those who struggle in Afghanistan receive effective support from us. The retreat of Soviet military power from Afghanistan is complete. One of the largest covert operations ever run by the CIA. The East German government said tonight they were going to make more openings in the wall. I can report to the nation, aggression is defeated, the war is over. Well, now comes word, at least unofficially, sources reporting that it was in fact a bomb. In our religion, it is not permissible for any non-Muslim to stay in Arabia. I ordered our armed forces to strike at terrorist-related facilities in Afghanistan and Sudan. If the free world were to turn its back on Afghanistan, then, in a sense, the free world would become less free and less humane. But when we support the Afghan people, we become caught up in and ennobled by their struggle for freedom. Isn't that what America is always, what has always stood for, and what we should stand for in 1986 and beyond? When discussing history, we like to put events into chapters. When an event ends, the chapter ends. And it's especially easy to do as an American. But history doesn't work like that. History is messy. It overlaps. While the US was in the heydays of Reaganomics, the Soviets were fighting in the mountains of Afghanistan in a war that wouldn't end for 10 years. And we made sure of it. This is a story about how the last chapter of the Cold War ended and our blind support of the heroes created the villains for the next. Our story begins in the 1960s. Afghanistan was a kingdom ruled under King Mohammad Zahir Shah, much like Iran, was attempting to reform the country. In 1973, the king was overthrown peacefully by his cousin, Mohammad Daoud Khan. Khan did the same reforms, however he was incredibly biased to his own group the Pashtuns, and soon everyone was against him. In 1978, another revolution took place, this time a communist one. The president was deposed and killed, and the country was officially declared a communist state, the Democratic Republic of Afghanistan. The DRA right off the bat was in big trouble. They attempted to set out more reforms like women's right to education and a more secular state, but also implemented pretty terrible land reforms and cracked down on those that spoke up. This only angered the rural population, and a rebellion against the state erupted. Afghanistan's communist state was losing control as city after city rebelled, and they asked for aid from the Soviets, who complied. Afghanistan's president Nur Mohammad Tariqi was killed and replaced by a new leader, Hafizullah Amin, who was far more radical. The Soviets decided to go in to stop Afghanistan from falling to Islamic forces, just like Iran. They invaded, killed Amin, and replaced him with a moderate. But what went from a rebellion against the communist government became a full-blown insurgency against an intervention. To the Soviets at first, they thought they were helping the Afghan people. The April Revolution, as it was called, was to make Afghanistan a modern state. One with rights for all and bringing it away from backwards tribalism that made up the nation. And to the Afghans, the Soviets were atheist invaders trying to destroy the one thing that unified them all, Islam. And a jihad was declared. The Soviets really didn't know what they were walking into. If you know anything about the US and Afghanistan, let me know if this sounds familiar. The cities were effectively controlled, however the newly declared Mujahideen, or as the Soviets called them, bandits, moved to the mountains, picking when and where to fight. The Afghan's communist army was ineffective as they lacked morale or just did it for a paycheck. What was meant to be a quick occupation to help set up a friendly government became a quagmire. Afghanistan was split between tribes and ethnic groups. The bandits were only getting stronger. Suicide attacks. Chopper shot down from just small arms fire. 
men finding their fellow soldiers decapitated on spikes, and the Soviets eventually just stopped caring. Entire villages were annihilated, simply to weed out guerrillas. Innocent civilians gunned down simply to get to the bandits. The survivors always executed to not spread the word about the war crimes. And it only got worse. The Mujahideen were certainly no angels. It certainly wasn't united, and it'd be unfair of me to portray the entire Mujahideen in this light. The opposition to the Soviets ranged from even Marxist groups, to moderate Islamists, to hardcore fanatics. Afghanistan became the Syria of the 80s, with fighters from across the Islamic world coming to fight the atheist Soviets. Even groups comprised of all Arabs, ones led by, well, you know who I'm gonna say, Osama bin Laden. Bin Laden was a rich kid, who brought his knowledge of business and building for all to play with. And the war was pretty much college, where Islamic fighters learned to combat the enemy and harden their skills. And you can't go to college without tuition, and guess who just loved to pay the bill? The US began to funnel weapons and money to the Mujahideen through Pakistan in what was called Operation Cyclone, starting in the early 80s. Pretty much, here's the funds and guns, Pakistan picked somebody to go after the Soviets. By 1987, $600 million were being funneled to the fighters a year. All of course thanks to the Reagan Doctrine. But it wasn't just the US. Many Muslim nations as well contributed, such as Turkey, and most importantly, Saudi Arabia. Oh boy. Now, who were actually getting these funds was actually not that complicated, since Pakistan was the one giving out the money. They were the ones picking which groups would get it and they really liked to hand it to what we'd see today as Islamic extremists. But back then, they were anti-Soviet freedom fighters. After 10 years of war, problems at home, and a new premier who just wanted to get out of there, the Soviets left Afghanistan in 1989. Just two years later, the Union itself would dissolve. Wall comes down, all the new countries are formed, you know the story. To the US, this is where it all ended. The Cold War was over. Afghanistan was left to itself, now an unimportant spot on the map without the international battle between the superpowers to keep interest. Saddam invaded Kuwait, and most American attention was either on the Persian Gulf or on domestic issues. But for Afghanistan, the story continued. From 1989 to 1992, the DRA attempted to decommunize itself to win support with the rebellion. Peace talks failed, elections were boycotted, a new constitution went through. Without the support of the Soviets, the DRA rebranded itself and called it quits. The Mujahideen had won. The war was over. Until the infighting started. We'll talk about that in a sec. But, quick side note. Afghanistan is just a mess of ethnic groups. The majority group located in the south are called the Pashtun. The Pashtuns span both Afghanistan and Pakistan, divided down the middle. Now, why did this happen? Oh, I think you can take an easy guess. The British. When India was formed, the British divided the Pashtuns up to make Afghanistan a buffer zone with Russia to protect India. And the locals have not been happy about that ever since. Side note over. Gulbuddin Hekmantar, considered one of the best men for Pakistan, and therefore the CIA, during the Soviet War. His group, we'll just call them HIG, received the most funding out of the many groups in the Mujahideen. The US had quite the relationship with Hekmatar. It wasn't like they were blind to his anti-American tendencies, even declined to go see Ronald Reagan, but sometimes they even went above and beyond what even Pakistan was doing, in personally funding his group despite their heroin operations during the 80s. Not to tolerate drugs by anyone, anytime, any place. So by now it's 1991. The Mujahideen agreed to form a coalition government, including many of the groups, except for what was the once good old US-backed Hekmatar, still supported by Pakistan. So why did Pakistan still support HIG? 
despite the war already being over. Well, these borders. Hig was Pastion. Pakistan wanted them to control Afghanistan. And yes, the country would be Islamic, but more importantly, it would be a friendly ethnic neighbor. Hekmatar had gotten a bit too confident in his ambitions and went rogue. Hig attacked the capital, sparking war between the Mujahideen, now split between mostly ethnic lines, the non-Pashtun versus the Pashtun. The Pakistan CIA-supported man was the one who threw a Molotov into any idea of peace. Because of this brilliant action, and realizing their man wasn't going to take the country, Hig was abandoned by Pakistan, who began funding a new up-and-coming rival Pashtun group, the Taliban. The Taliban by 1994 spread much like ISIS in Syria, pushing back the rest of the Mujahideen further and further north until taking a now war-battered Kabul in 1996. Hig was beaten and dissolved. However, many of its members simply changed sides to the Taliban out of tribal alliance. By the end of 96, Afghanistan was a Pashtun Islamic Emirate funded by Pakistan. The opponents to the Taliban held out. Former rivals, some moderate, some not, comprising mostly of Tajiks and other ethnic minorities, formed together into what we know as the Northern Alliance. The US by the 90s had stopped funding either side in this fight. A common misconception is that when the CIA gave the Mujahideen money, it went from here to here. But that's a vast oversimplification. It was from here to here. Those billions of dollars never went directly into what we think of as Al-Qaeda, even what was proto-Al-Qaeda. Now, they knew of him, and Bin Laden was working with Saudi intelligence, but outside of that, the trail ends. So while this didn't directly lead to this, it did pave the road for the quagmire we're currently in. It's not so simple as I once thought for one person to have the blame. The Soviets, in their fear of an Islamic revolution spreading, invaded Afghanistan who didn't care for communism or even basic reforms, beginning the decades of war that has obliterated the country. Since 2001, 31,000 Afghan civilians have died. In just 10 years of the Soviet war, that number was 500,000 to 2 million. This type of atrocity only helped to light a fire that had been growing in the Muslim world for decades. The situation was then fueled when the US misunderstood or didn't care about the change that was happening in the Islamic world because it intentionally brought down any regime that it felt was socialist in nature, leading to the exact opposite approach a new rise of fundamentalist Islamism. Operation Cyclone was a disaster because it funneled billions into groups we had a tentative and unknowing relationship with. But from that backing, the US gave too much power to Pakistan and Hig, and from that perpetuated a war for what was essentially ethnic nationalism and split by the British centuries ago because of rivalry with Russia. All of this culminating in September 2001, when the anti-Soviet Saudi fighter for peace flew planes into those towers. The span of time from the Soviets leaving Afghanistan to 9-11 is the same distance as today and the start of the Obama campaign. 9-11 was not out of nowhere, but a ghost from the Cold War era. This man, Ahmad Shah Massoud, was a leader of the last remnant of the original Mujahideen. He rejected and fought against the Taliban, forming the Northern Alliance. Throughout the 90s, he went to Europe to pressure Pakistan to stop supporting the regime. He was assassinated by the Taliban on September 9th, 2001. A month later, aided by American forces, the Northern Alliance rode south once again and retook Kabul. As a last note, since then, we're nearing the same span of time as the first Soviets crossing into Afghanistan and 9-11, as 9-11 is to us today. The only difference is America never left.
This video was inspired by the great gamble, the Soviet war in Afghanistan by Gregor Pfeiffer. It really helped paint a picture of how the entire situation came to be and why the Soviets got involved. I listened to it on Audible, who is today's sponsor. Audible has the largest catalog of audiobooks in basically any topic you can think of, and I use it all the time. Have you heard about it but never tried it out? Well, you can get your first audiobook for free plus two Audible Originals when you try Audible for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash althistory or text althistory to 500-500. It's the perfect way to listen to books to pass the time or perhaps expand your mind. As somebody who always has to multitask, I can't recommend it enough.